Well, welcome to Eclata Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we're going to talk about the life and ministry of Reiner Bunke. He was a powerful man, and I pray, Father, as we step into this, that we wouldn't come with a judgmental or critical spirit, but Holy Spirit, you would come and open our eyes so that we would gain insight, so that we can run the race set before us, and, and Father, be found faithful uh, in the precious name of Jesus. You know, look at Reiner Bonnke, and he was a nobody. But his story is also one of being the black sheep or the David. When we think of, of course, Reiner, we see the massive crowds. We see the millions of people that came to the Lord. We see the mighty miracles, the raising from the dead. But what we don't see is the man that started off as a David rejected, overlooked. As a person that had a burden to call that people couldn't understand or receive. And he had to pay a heavy price to really move forward and he had to press through a lot of roadblocks and resistance. That was the things that helped to make and fine-tune Reiner Bonnke and enable him to do what God called him to do. When we look around at Bank, we have to go back, of course, to Germany after the First World War. We go back to 1922. It was a time when Germany was suffering greatly. They were humiliated, humiliated after the loss of World War I. Uh, his family were in the army. And it's also time, of course, of hyperflation because Germany has to pay war reparations. And they're struggling with it. So the people are struggling. It's not a good time. It is also time where we're seeing Pentecostalism spreading. And with the Spirit-filled message, one of the things that they got hold of that we need to get back is when they received the Holy Ghost, there was a go to it. They felt to go forth. And of course, they would equip the call. They equipped the person and they recognized the call by the Holy Spirit because of the anointing on the person's life. And the person was equipped and released to do the purpose of God. And so people were going and they were... Sh of course, spreading the gospel worldwide. And so very quickly after Azusa, the gospel uh, of the Pentecostal message has been preached all around the world. In 1922, Ludwig Graf, a minister, of course, is Pentecostal, comes to the town of Truns where the Bonkies lived. The grandfather was very ill. And when Graf came, he says, you know, who's the sickest? Because they were not afraid to challenge God and trust that God could heal and they believed healing was part of evangelism so they are told you know about the the bonkies and he goes and he meets the bonkies and says you know if the Lord heals you will you receive Jesus and they agree and he prays over and the grandfather is healed and receives him and the wife received Jesus well his father hermit is a really bitter man uh, because of the loss but he's also very sick he's suffering from TB and he's been hiding and he's resisting but all to because he's in a place where he can't hide it anymore. He, he agrees and he's prayed over and he is healed. It would change his life forever. And Hermit now, not alone does he become a believer, he is sold out to preach in the Pentecostal gospel. In a nation, of course, where they had signed a thing against it. But, you know, when the call comes, it comes with a fire. And when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which he received, him and his wife, uh, there's really a pressing for, there's just, you know, a fire of God in us. Well, he would ultimately marry his wife, Mita, and um, again, he's part of the war, uh, part of the army, I should say, um, but he has a desire to pastor church. And so, at this time, he's part-time working in the gospel, and he, of course, he's in the army. Um, and in, during the 30s, he would have a series of children. And in 1939, on April 19th, they would give birth to their fifth child, Reinhardt. Well, Reinhardt wasn't the chosen one. They saw the oldest son as the one that the father assumed would take over the pastorship, the leadership role. But that was in God's choosing. And we have to understand that a lot of time, I think particularly today in the church, we want to pass it down. And, and it's always been the challenge in church, who will be the next leader? 
And so we assume, and instead of allowing the Holy Ghost to raise up the person, that may not be the person we expected. So Reinhardt was the black sheep, the David, the one overlooked, the one when he would stand up and say, God has called me, they would say no. Well, during the war, uh, of course it was a difficult time, Reinhardt's father um, fought in the war. He did not know what was going on until the end, and he started to oppose when he heard what was going on with the Jews. Well, in 1945, of course, um, the Russians were now advancing and they had to flee. So the mother takes the kids and she's fleeing to Danzig uh, to get to safety. And it's, it, it's a terrible season, but she knew how to pray and she knew to trust God. And, uh, you know, Reinhardt is seeing this in her and she's trusting God to make it to Danzig. They come to a part where they have to cross the, the ice to get there. Um, and they make it across just in time before the Russians break up the ice with bombs. Well, the next is the challenge of her. How is she going to get to, of course, to, or to Denmark, where they were fleeing? And around this time, they actually lose sight of Reinhardt and they have to pray. And, and you know, because God has a wonderful way of protecting his people. And the enemy is always out to kill, steal, and destroy. Somehow, the, the enemy recognizes the gift even before it comes forth. And he tries to destroy or kill or steal in some way that gift because the greatest threat to him is the call of God when we step into it. You know, it's not just becoming a believer. Many people go to church and become Christians, but that's the extent that they do things at church. But it's the followers that lay hold of the call and go forth and do something. Oh, he hates them because those are the ones that do damage to his kingdom. So the mother, Mita, um, she gets hold of a prayer promise, stands in the word and trusts God, and God gets them safely from Danzig to Denmark, where they would spend four years living as a refugee. It was a difficult time because the father is still in Germany um, and you know it's a hard time because they are the people that you know caused the war and everything else they're hated. Well, in 1949, they're finally allowed to return to Germany, and they meet up with Hermit. Uh, and this is the time that Hermit now steps into preaching full-time. And Reinhardt, at the same, in 1949, he wants to know the Lord. And he actually asks the mother. The mother leads him in the salvation prayer. And then at church, he confesses. Um, Reinhardt immediately has this burden for the Lord. He, he sees the mother and father, I think, a certain night a week, they would go to a prayer meeting, and he wants to be part of it. Because of the call, he's disturbed. And even as a young child, when it didn't make sense, he's drawn to it. And his parents can't understand, you know, you're a child. Why do you want to go to a prayer meeting? But Reiner keeps pressing, I want to go. So he finally goes. And, you know, at that meeting, a woman prophesies. I had this vision. And I saw this young boy standing before crowds of black people. And she looks and says, Reiner, you're that person. You know, not long after, Reiner had a vision uh, where he sees Africa and he sees Johannesburg. And he now knows the Lord is calling him to South Africa. He keeps presenting this to his father. And of course, his father is very opposed to it, does not agree with it. In 1951, Reiner would get spirit-filled. It's something he's desiring. He saw the impact it had in his mother's life, and he wants that. And it really supercharged. Um, what was in him now, there's, a, there's like a battery just went off. There's, some, there's a fire in him now to fulfill the purpose of God. Everything's focused on that. And despite the resistance, and his father's strongly opposed, he's determined. But they agree, you know, if you're going to work, and in ministry, you're going to need something to support you. If you're going to be an evangelist, you need to learn a trade. And I believe he started, uh, tried a carpentry and he failed at that. And then he went on and he became an assistant or training to be a merchant at EDEKA. And he would take his money and put it aside. Uh, and, and he's just really preparing and seeking the next step. Well, ultimately, God would bring a man, a Reverend Morris, to visit their church. And Reverend Morris said, you know what, you should go and... Um, to the Welsh Bible School, the place that was critical 
and the Welsh Revival of 1904 and 5. And Reiner is really a person that studied church history. He was greatly moved by. He loved George Bueller. He loved Evan Roberts. Uh, these people really blessed him. And he felt the Lord saying, yes, this is where I need to go. But once again, there's a great resistance. His brothers strongly opposed it. And the brothers really were starting to step into the world. Um, they felt like, you know what, don't waste your time. You know, they did not see the value of ministry. But Reinhardt was a different child. He was, you know, called by God, and the call just wouldn't let go. So Reinhardt applies, and of course, is rejected. Um, but the minister would personally write a letter for him and get him in. Now, during that time period, Reinhardt preached. His father wouldn't allow him to preach, but he does preach. And when Reinhardt preached, you know, people were impacted. People began to be moved. People were stirred. Uh, there was a response because with the appointment comes an anointing. Um, and Reiner was starting to step into that. Well, ultimately, Reiner was allowed to go to the Welsh Bible School. And uh, it would be a challenge to him because, of course, he spoke in German. He had to learn English. It's interesting that the thing that hindered him, of course, was the fact he couldn't speak English. And he learned English. He would ultimately preach more messages in English than he did in German. So during this time, of course, it's evangelical Bible school, not Pentecostal. And so he's not able to preach in tongues, but it's unique that because he spoke German, they thought a lot of times he was speaking in German or some other language when he was speaking in tongues. But he learned a lot. There was a real sound foundation in the Word. Um, and they taught him how to walk by faith. It was something that was really uh, bred or burned into them. And they had to learn to... Trust God by getting alone in secret and praying for God for their needs to be met. They weren't to tell people publicly, but they trusted them. And then they would, when they got the need met, they were to rejoice and make it known. So Reiner, you know, has several challenges this, to this. Once where the Lord tells him to give us money, and he gives part of it, until the, finally the Lord really convicts him uh, to give all of it. You know, another time Reiner is, has to go preach at Sunshine Center, and... Um, he has the money and he, for him and his friend to get there, but he doesn't have the money to get back. But he's trusting the Lord. He tells his friend, I, we, we're, the Lord's going to meet the need. We're going to just trust God. And so he goes and he preaches. And that afternoon, he meets up with the pastor. And the pastor says, hey, let's have tea together. Reiner thinking it's often we do that. You know, God's going to use this man to meet the need. But he didn't do anything. So now it's time to go home and they don't have the money. What is going to happen? It's the 11th hour and the need is still there. As they're getting ready to get on the bus, all of a sudden this woman runs up and says, I heard you preach this morning and I meant to give it to you earlier, but here is something. And it was just the right amount of money to get them home. Reinhardt was learning how to walk by faith. Now, he failed his preaching class, and you know, he thought about it. It really bothered him. But the Lord said, I didn't call you to be a teacher. I called you to preach the ABCs of the gospel. And so Reinhardt went forth with that belief, that, that, that foundation. He returned home, um, and he decides you know, that he is going to begin this church. Um, he, he has the burden of course, to move to Africa, and he's working towards it. Back in Germany, they don't recognize that Bible school, and so he's going to have to go through Bible school again to get ordained, to get a license, and so he's working towards it, uh, and he begins this church. Now, he also at a rally meets this woman, and, you know, he just, this is, this is the woman for me, um, and he discovers where she's from, and he asks that preacher if he could come and preach there, and they agree. And so he comes and he preaches there and he gets an opportunity to meet with this lady, Annie. And he talks to her and he shares with her, you know, the vision and discovers she's a nurse. She's going to Bible school and she wants to be on the mission field. 
You know, it's so important that the person that we would run with uh, is in agreement because the two have to be in agreement. And that help me, it has to be somebody that flows with you, that adds. And, you know, because behind the scenes, you need somebody supporting, somebody that's, you know, able to pray for you, uh, encourage you in the difficult times, and add to you, not be a distraction, not be a hindrance, as so many in ministry discovered. Uh, we look at how many people, you know, wanted and were burned to do something, and their running mate really was one of the greatest hindrances and, and, and stumbling blocks for that. So Reiner understood this. He chose this woman, and, and they began corresponding and um, really falling in love with each other. Ultimately, they would be married by the father, um, and they go, as I said, they start this church up in, uh, I think it's Hamburg or somewhere north of, of Germany. And they start this church, um, and initially, they're, you know, they're looking for a building. Where are we going to meet? Uh, and they find this old place, and he goes to the landlord, and they don't have a lot of money. You know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to meet this? And the guy explains they're going to tear down the building in, I think, one or two years, but agrees to give them this lease at an incredible rate uh, that really will help them. And Reinhardt now slowly builds this church as he prepares to go to Africa. You know, God is working on Reinhardt and really preparing him. Well, in 1967, they finally, you know, they, they, they've been going after, hey, look, we want to go to Africa, but the organization says, no, we can send you to Zambia. We have, you know, missionaries going to Zambia, but not South Africa because there's apartheid, there's issues there. But Reiner would say, no, I'm called to South Africa. And you're going to see one of the things that was critical to Reiner was this, he, he, he locked in. When he heard from the Lord, he refused to quit. Many of us will compromise saying, well, this must be the open door. But Reiner said, no, the Lord said, that door. And I'm going through that door. And he refused to pull back until that door opened. And so Reiner, you know, persists and finally says, okay, we will send you to South Africa. We'll put you under somebody for a year. And after one year, you'll be loose to go and preach. So in 1967, him and his wife Annie, um, they head to South Africa. And they go through the Suez Canal uh, just at the time of the Six-Day War. And they get through just in time before the Suez Canal is locked down. Finally, they make it to South Africa, and he began to preach there. But as he looks in South Africa, you know, he abhors, he's against apartheid. And the person he put under a reverend spies is a really a racist person, and it disturbs Reinhardt. He doesn't like it because he looks at the black people as brethren where the law of the whites didn't, and it really, really offended Reinhardt. Ultimately, based on the law, the comments that Spies was saying, he went back to the organizations and, and he, he formed a complaint. He said, you know, no, I can't do this. I cannot sit under this man for one year based on all this racism. And they loose Reinhardt and allow him now to go preach. So Reinhardt now steps forward. And I apologize if I get names wrong, but I think it's Lesetho. And he moves there, this part of South Africa, which is independent. And he goes and he lives among the black people, the black community, and he starts this church there. He rents a building, you know, for their headquarters, and it's right by the communist headquarters. And he could hear them cursing and swearing, uh, but he's praying. And he wanted them to hear him praying. When he prayed, he prayed loud, he prayed bold. He was a man that prayed and fasted and sought after the Lord. Everything was built upon prayer and pressing in. And one day he meets them, of course, they would harass him. And he says, within one year, the Lord will remove you. Uh, and shortly afterwards, the government made a crackdown on communists, and they were removed. But Reiner begins preaching. And he begins his open-air meetings, you know, where God is, you know, the stage one. We see Reiner at the end, but we've got to see the stages that God took him through to get him to the end. And he begins meeting, and he begins preaching. Um, and he, it, it's step by step. You know, and he ultimately then goes for it, he, he gets a tent, you know, getting small numbers, but slowly it's growing. 
he opens this Bible school, this correspondence Bible school that at one point has 50,000 people because he's, he just has a burden. Um, they start bikes and they get people bikes so that they can be evangelists and go forth on a bike and reach more of the towns and cities. Reiner always is looking, okay, how do I go to the next level? There's one time where he comes to this town, he's like, how do I reach the young people? They're going to the discos and the dance halls. And so he waits till the end, he goes to the end because he's been praying and God gives him a word. And we need a now word. How God, what's the word to reach this people? And the Lord showed him. And he was able to preach the gospel effectively because it was a now word for them. And he reached those young people. And that's how Reinhardt worked. So he buys, he gets a tent, and now he begins these tent campaigns. Uh, and step by step, what you see is that God is increasing and adding more people. Uh, and you know, there's more people because, as I said, with the appointing goes an anointing and there's an influence. And as we're faithful, the degree of influence increases. And we need influence. Uh, you need influence in terms of you know, drawing people, having the right people at the right place at the right time. And God started to do that with Reinhardt. Uh, he gets an interpreter. I mean, he has a guy that was a, a uh, Jehovah Witness, and he leads him to the Lord ultimately over a period of time, and he becomes his interpreter. Uh, and there's one stage where, you know, he's called to this woman uh, who has cancer, and he brings his interpreter. Of course, he's black, and he knows that this, there's this racism, so he doesn't bring him in. And the woman's, you know, read and heard about Reiner, and um, so she, where's Michael? And so she brings him in. And they pray over her, and she, of course, is healed. And God starts to do this with key people that would be critical for influence and other resources that Reinhardt would need. Well, Reinhardt now has a bigger vision. Reinhardt, you know, is seeing great increase. And so he goes to the board and says, you know, I want to increase. I want to get a bigger tent, and I want to start doing campaigns and uh, going more places. And they're like, no. No, 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 because they see the, you know, how what's going to cost and everything else, and they don't have it. But see, Reinhardt is different, and from the get-go, he's had to go against the grain. He's had to stand firm, trust when God said something, to go with it. And so he stands persistent, and he finds there he has to resign from it. Um, and they say, no, 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 don't resign. We'll, we'll work out a compromise. But they're unable to compromise. But Reinhardt stands firm. Reinhardt never backed down. You know, we got to learn not to back down to the intimidation of the devil or men. When you, you've got into the secret place and you've heard from heaven, you run with what heaven has said. And Reiner ran with it and refused to quit. So Reiner moves forth, he gets this tent, uh, and he goes to one place, you know, and it's a place where its pastors are destroyed. And the enemy will often bring you to places, you know what, I've destroyed all kinds of people here, I'm going to destroy you. And Reiner goes in, of course, a storm breaks out, and it's beginning to ruin the tent, and it's not looking good. And you can hear the enemy saying, I told you so, I'm going to destroy you and bring an end to you. But something inside of Reiner, as he heard from the Lord, was stirred. And we need to be stirred. we got to get that righteous anger from heaven to stand up and speak to that situation, which Reiner did, and rebuked it, and the Lord's resources were released. You know, God works with us, and He expects us to learn how to step up, stand strong, and lay hold of His promises and declare His will on the earth. So Reinhardt had a break in through in that place. Well, Reinhardt now um, begins a newsletter, and he's writing with it, and he calls it Christ for the Nations. And it really been the beginning. He prayed about the name, and it really begins the name of this ministry, that he has a burden for more people. He gets a vision that all of Africa will be saved. It's not just South Africa anymore, but he's now got this burden that somehow from Cape Town to Cairo, he's going to preach this gospel. Uh, and Lord, you know, he's trusting. And there, each step is more and more difficult. But each step, there's more and more resources of heaven. So by the late 70s, he's now preaching more and more places. And he now desires to get the world's biggest tent, it's going to hold 30,000 people, but he has to begin to travel to raise the money. By this point, God has given him greater influence, and now he's got people like Ken Copeland and Gloria Copeland, Ray McCauley, and other famous preachers sponsoring and helping him. The, the, the tent he figured would take a year and a half. It took much longer. But during this time period, he continues to hold campaigns, and God is moving him, you know. 
One of the campaigns he'd done, you know, Lord had told him, you know what, uh, you're going to go to the national stadium. And he begins this campaign. He brings in the person to help with him. And, um, you know, the first night it's a few hundred. And they keep standing the next night more. And so ultimately they filled the stadium. And this is how God would work. You know, the numbers are increasing. And, and, and God's stretching. A lot of time we have, we put limitations on God. We see, well, it can only be this many. But he started to see a bigger vision and trusting God. And God would stretch and take from a small group to a national stadium. And so Reiner is now seeing that, that he can reach nations differently. And so he now begins campaigns through various countries. And by the 70s, he's now reading 40, 50,000 people at these campaigns. In the 80s, he started to travel, as said, worldwide and continue with these campaigns. By the end of the 80s, by the early 90s, he's now reaching crowds of almost 1 million people. So step by step, it's hard to imagine he goes from a few hundred to thousands, now to almost a million people, step by step. The world's largest tent, when he gets it, you know, because he sets it up, uh, he's gone, and when he's gone, it is destroyed. And uh, he's like, uh, you know, the enemy will always try to come to kill and to steal something. But you have to learn to trust God, and, and the Lord at Turin said, you can believe me for a million dollars. You know, God would open the, the door and always what seemed impossible to Reinhardt, God would call him and say, trust me. And as he trusted him, God delivered. In the 80s, God would bring forth another man called Peter Vandenberg uh, during his campaign at, in Britain and Birmingham. And I remember that campaign, you know, watching a video of a lady that was dramatically healed of a back issue at that, in, at that situation. And she was going to have surgery that would leave her paralyzed. But after being healed, she went back to the doctors who confirmed on the video that this woman no longer needed surgery, that she was indeed healed in a nation that's so resistant today to divine healing. But Reinhardt seen great miracles and people, of course, healed of all kinds of things and delivered. The ministry now grown that he has a team of 6,000 plus, you know, uh, people, counselors that would lead people in the prayer of salvation. He no longer prays over people individually, but prays over the masses because there's simply so many. And God begins to move as they're preaching. People are getting healed here and there and, and, and receiving Jesus. And then, of course, there's counselors to then minister to them afterwards. So the campaigns are changing. And as I said, each step, God is moving. He has a burden now for these fire meetings. And um, he now wants to raise up leaders to go and take Africa. And he has his fire meeting where 40 plus nations out of all 40 something nations that are in Africa attend. Most of Africa is present. And I believe there are 4,100 attendees at this meeting where they are stirred and there's a fire from heaven based on the call. You know, one of the things that I will stand with with Reiner, which you see in the early spirit filled people, was when they saw and received the fire of the Holy Ghost, they were empowered to go. You know, in churches today, we want to build the church and people to be part of the church. And we think of Christians, you know, you tend to uh, turn church and you do things at church. But we've lost the importance of followers, those that go out and those that do, those that preach and those that step forward based on the call on the inside of them. And so Reinhardt wanted to infuse them with the Holy Ghost so they would step forth with fire. The fire meetings would ultimately expand and go into Europe. And Reinhardt would actually move his headquarters to uh, Frankfurt as the vision is beginning to expand. But the vision focused mainly on Africa. And so by the 90s, by 1997, um, he was finally able to get into certain nations like Egypt, where he had been, you know, the door had been shut. And it's easy to get discouraged along the way when we see places that there's certain doors shut. You know, the Lord's called us to do things and certain doors are not opening. We've got to step forth step by step and in due season, God will do it. God will bring it forth. And you see step by step, you know, each step, like Nigeria, you went to Nigeria, the raising of the money was too much. He couldn't do it, but God provided and God opened the door and they did it and started to see really massive crowds in Nigeria. So God really was taking Reinhardt on this journey step by step. 
uh, to take in, as I said, from Cape Town to Cairo, that he would complete. But now he's starting to stir people worldwide. And I can personally thank Reiner Bonnke for the impact he had on me, even in my teenage years, um, just to really stir and learn about his prayer teams that would go into a city beforehand and pray and stand. You know, he came and there was so much prayer backing what they did to see the results that they saw. Um, you know, we think it's very easy just to go in and do our campaigns, but we under forget the importance of building it upon prayer and seeking God and crying out and standing in agreement and, and having a team of people. And I said, one of the persons was Peter Vandenberg that they met at this meeting in Birmingham. And he really helped. He had a great anointing to organize. There was a great machinery to the campaigns, trucks and stuff like that, that there were so many problems. They didn't run right and on time and stuff like that. And Peter Vandenberg stepped in and he helped to organize and really help. And God, if we're willing and, and obedient, will bring the right people the right time to really aid us. Uh, as I look at many ministries that, you know, derailed or failed, they assumed as the, these things came along that they were anointed and appointed to do everything. And we're not. And we've got to recognize when God brings the right person into our life that we need them, that they will add and support the areas that we're weak in because we are not the be-all, end-all. We're just part of it, and we're to do our purpose, which, which Reinhardt was to what, preach this gospel. Well, Reinhardt, you know, of course, was set out as an evangelist, and many people think of him strictly in that terms, but he was a great teacher. Uh, I don't think he set out to be one, but he wrote many great books that have great uh, wisdom in it. You know, Reinhardt did not believe, for example, in the leaking theory, you know, where people receive the Holy Ghost, they've got to keep getting a fresh filling. Um, he believed as you go forth, you know, the problem was that people were just not going forth. <clears throat> so he preached a lot on fire and how to live a life with fire uh, that really can stir up the spirit man on the inside of you, stir up the gift, and there's some powerful insight from him. Well, in 2017, Reinhardt would have his farewell tour. By that time, they'd lead 77 million people to the Lord. We're not talking thousands, we're talking 77 million. And how many people did they lead to the Lord? We see that Africa is a changed nation. You know, where do we need missionaries? It's no longer Africa. It's the America and Europe. The, the spiritual climate has changed and many African nations are now sending missionaries out because of the work of men like Reinhard Bonnke that changed the climate. And we need Reinhard Bonnke's today here in the U.S. and in Europe to rise up and with the boldness press forth and believe God for big things. You know, we've got to get, God, I want to be big for you. I want to do something extraordinary. Most people want to do ordinary things. I want to do something extraordinary. I want to step forth and reach more and more people for Jesus. Amen. Well, he then, Daniel Kalin, of course, would take over for him and now runs the race. Uh, you know, Reinhard Bonnke, of course, would come down with cancer in the throat, I believe. And in 2019, uh, the end of last year, he was promoted to glory. Reinhard Bonnke strongly believed that we were living in the last days and that Jesus was coming soon. That was part of the motivation to reach as many people. And I pray that, you know, as we recognize that we are living in the last days. And, you know, I don't know if the Lord will tarry or not, but let us be found occupying till He comes, step by step. You know, learning that, you know what, the great things are started by what we do in the days of the small beginnings, being found faithful and daring to step up. You know, His Father, as I said, resisted Him for so long, didn't allow Him to preach for so long in that church. But one day the Father came to one of His campaigns and repented. You know, a lot of the people that resist us, I pray that, at some point, the Holy Spirit will get a hold of them and they will repent. But regardless, we must learn to press forward. We must really be forged in the fire of the secret place, hearing of the Holy Ghost, so that we do run and that we are, there's a, perver a perseverance in us to press on regardless. Um, I'm not talking about having wisdom and insight from other people, people that can temper us and aid us but we must be careful that they don't derail what's inside of us. We need good people in our lives. We need people that feed the call, stir up the gift. We need spiritual fathers because a father doesn't want to control. I don't tell my kids, you go and do this. Um, the goal is to mature them and develop them so they can become adults and run the race set before them. 
And you know, if the Lord tarries, raise up the next generation. We always must be raising up the next generation. It must not be about us and building our kingdom, but are we raising up leaders so that they will go forth? And you see that in Reiner Bonnke in his fire uh, and other things that he did. And I pray that as you look at Reiner Bonnke, he would provoke you. His life and ministry would challenge you and that you too would step up to the plate and dare, as I said, to be extraordinary by spending time in prayer and fasting in the Word and through simple acts of obedience and refusing compromise. Having a spirit just to press on. You know one of the things I was told, Reiner Bonnke was like us, he was human. And sometimes we put people on pedestals. We think of them as super spiritual and just, you know what, they are so holy, so perfect, but they're not. Like Elijah, they are people of like passion. And they need to be tempered by the Holy Spirit, changed and transformed. But one of the things I'm going to tell you, there's certain character personality traits that we have that help us and will aid us do the call if they are tempered by the Holy Ghost. There can be a stubbornness in us that when tempered by the Holy Ghost becomes a perseverance to press through resistance. If it's not and it's controlled by the flesh, of course, then it will also kill the call. So we need to learn to allow the Holy Ghost to so take us and change us and transform us that we run correctly. Amen? Well, I pray that you're blessed and encouraged by this message. And I said, check out some of Reiner Bonnke's teachings and may they stir the gift on the inside of you. And I'm just praying over that gift, that it be released and everything that's really discouraged and, and, and just tried to steal the gift, I come against it in the mighty name of Jesus. And may the fire of the Holy Ghost fall afresh on you. Oh, may you be stirred from the very tips of your toes to the top of your heads with a fresh passion and fire of the Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you for the gift and calling. We sanctify and consecrate unto you, Father. It is yours. Use it for your glory. Expand it. Increase the pegs of our tents, Father God. Oh, Father God, show us afresh the vision and purpose you have for us. And this day, ignite us for you. Use us for your glory, as I said. Father, I thank you for each person watching watching and listening, I stand in the gap and I thank you for their mission and I thank you for the purpose you've given them and that we stand together that Jesus will be magnified and there be a harvest of souls for Jesus in this hour. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you and be blessed in the name of Jesus.